Welcome everybody to worship for Sunday, May 2nd. We're glad you could join us today. Uh, you're gonna find some pre-recorded material that we've done, some of it before the mask mandate. So you'll notice uh, that some of the people will be singing without masks, that's the reason why. Uh, there's also gonna be a Roseville story time and a sermon by Pastor Randy. We're really excited you could join us and uh, please join us now as we uh, lift, our, lift our voices up in song to the Lord.
time. Hi there, we have a few announcements for you all this week. Uh, we have Roseville Youth will be continuing Thursday nights. We're also offering a Hearing God seminar, uh, which we invite anybody from the church family can partake from junior high all the way up to senior adults. Uh, we'll be, it's a six week long intensive course where, where we will be learning more about how to hear God better in our lives from Pastor Ray Dirksen. There will also be some opportunities to practice what we're learning. Uh, it'll be offered over via Zoom, as well as some in-person options uh, for those who would like to take advantage of that. If you can contact Pastor Randy at randym at rosevilleub.ca uh, to reserve your spot, we do have some material that we would like to get to you before the seminar begins. That'll be taking place uh, the following next Tuesday. Uh, let's spend some time praying. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for uh, everything that you are blessing us with, everything that you've given us in the, last, in the last week. We just thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship you wherever we are. We thank you that we can spend time uh, connecting with you, knowing you more and more. Father, we pray for all the needs that are going on right now and within our church family. We pray for those who um, are still experiencing the effects of isolation, we ask that you be with them, that you lift up their spirits. We ask that you continue to mobilize your people to find and discover needs and to be your hands and feet in meeting those needs, Lord. We pray that you continue to be with our government leaders and officials as they continue to make decisions uh, to try to keep people safe and healthy while also trying to keep people working and employed. And we pray that you will give them wisdom as they navigate those roads. Be with teachers and students as they are coming to the end of the school year and we ask that you'll give them the strength that they need to finish well. And we, Father, we also lift up all the health concerns within our community right now for those who uh, are experiencing physical pain and discomfort. Uh, we ask that you will meet them in those needs and those moments, provide for them, Lord. Father, we thank you for that you are such an active God, that you are still on the move. We thank you for the ways that you are working worldwide and we pray specifically for the missionaries that we support here at Roseville Church. We lift up the Glunt family in particular and the uh, community center that they oversee and we just ask that you continue to give wisdom and guidance to, to the Glunts and their team as they seek to minister to the people of Thailand. Lord, we pray for Pastor Randy. We ask that you uh, bless him with your words, that his words may be your words and that we will be impacted by what you want to tell us. Prepare our hearts to receive comfort, exhortation, encouragement, or correction, Lord. We thank you. It's in these, it's in these things we pray. Amen. Welcome, everybody, to a Roseville story time here. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Roseville story time. I'm your host, Montague, and joining me is Pastor Andrew to help the show flow. Okay, Montague, we've been over this. What? Been over what? We're co-hosting. We're working together on Roseville Storytime. You're not the primary host. We're both hosts. Right. Whatever helps you sleep at night, Pastor Andrew. <laughs> okay. Anyway, what have you been up to this past week, Montague? Well, We've been going for a lot of really nice drives, haven't we? Yes, we have. We've been going for a lot of wonderful drives. It's been a great way to get outside and see new things. I've really been enjoying them. Me too. What kinds of things have you noticed? What kinds of things have you seen? Well, there was that one time when we were driving and I saw that massive tree fort. It was absolutely huge and it was built right in a tree and it had this amazing slide and these amazing swings and I just wanted to go and play in the tree fort. Yeah, but that would have required pulling over and climbing a 12 foot fence. I don't think the owner of the home would have appreciated that. Well, I suppose you're right. Oh, and then there's that one time when we were driving and I saw that massive trampoline and kids were jumping like 15 feet in the air and it was incredible and I just wanted to go and jump and jump and jump and that would have been awesome. Yeah, but again, that required jumping another fence and I don't think the owner of that house would have appreciated that. Mm, 
Well, there's that one time, I mean, some of the days have been a little warm, and there's some people opening up their pools. It's absolutely incredible. And there's that time that there's that one pool with the water slide and the diving board, and I just wanted to go jump and jump and jump and jump and splash and splash and splash. <sighs> yeah, but again, that would have required jumping another fence and getting into somebody else's yard. Montague, I'm noticing that you're noticing a lot of things you don't have on our drives. Well, that's true, I guess. But you, you're not, you haven't noticed like the sunsets that we've seen or some of the really cool f cloud formations or even some of the squirrels that have been like wrestling over nuts and stuff. Like you haven't seen any of that? Well, no, not really. I haven't been focusing on those things. I've been focusing on really cool things that I'm seeing. Okay, but here's the thing, Montague. When, 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 when you're when you're focusing on the things you don't have, it's actually not very good for you. Well, what do you mean? Well, Proverbs fourteen thirty tells us that a heart at peace gives life, but that envy rots the bones. Rots the bones. Rots the bones. What do you mean rots the bones? How do bones rot? Well, we've talked about how Proverbs just give us word pictures. So you're right. Bones don't usually rot. But what do bones do? Well, they sustain your life. They hold your life up. They make sure that it's strong and firm and it's able to move and do what it's supposed to do. That's right. Well, when you have envy, it's a disease. It actually starts tearing apart the stability that you have in your life. It starts robbing you of your peace. It starts making it so that your life doesn't feel very stable anymore when all you're noticing and focusing on are the things you don't have. Oh, you know, that kind of makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and, and the Bible, and particularly in the book of Philippians, Paul tells us that we need to be content about everything. In every circumstance, we need to be content with the things God has already given us, and that gives us joy. That brings us joy. That brings us peace. Oh, brings us joy and peace. So not focusing on what we don't have. Yeah, it's okay to notice like cool things that other people have, but we can't focus on it. We can't be, that can't be the only thing we think about. Otherwise, that's going to pro cause problems for us. That, that's like a sickness and a disease that takes over our life. Oh, you know what? When we go on drives, can you, uh, can you help me notice some of the things you're seeing? Like some of the cloud formations and the pretty sunsets? You know what, Montague? I would love to do that for you. There are some really awesome things that God has created that are available for everybody. We should take some time to notice those things too. All right. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Mm -hmm. So remember Proverbs 14, 30. A heart at peace brings life, but envy rots the bones. That's, that's right. Thanks, Montague. Uh, join us next week for another Rise Family. Goodbye.
Welcome everyone who's joining us on your devices just for the message this morning. We're glad you're tuning in and can listen along. This is the first Sunday of May and I'm happy to say goodbye to April with uh, wet and cold weather and some snow and hail and welcome May, hoping for the temperatures to climb and for the COVID numbers to drop on the other side. Many of you are experiencing the restrictions and the difficulties of living through a pandemic. And in Ontario, we have over 650 people on ventilators. Our ICUs are overcrowded. They're shipping people up to 500 kilometers away in order to find ICU beds. It's been a terrible time for many people. But as we've looked in Judges chapter 6, our last couple of times, we've seen that God's people have also been through difficult times in the past, terrible times. In Judges 6, it's the story of Gideon, and we saw that it came about that God's people wandered away and went astray. They stopped following God and his laws and his commands. And as they worshiped idols and false religions, they got into many immoral practices and abandoned God's paths for their lives. So God took his hand of protection off them, allowed the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other Eastern people to enter the land and to pillage and plunder and, and punish the Israelite people for their waywardness. In the midst of that, God's people cried out for his help and God sent himself, actually. The angel of the Lord showed up and found a young man who was frightened and threshing out grain in a pit in a wine press instead of up on a level plain where the wind could blow away the chaff. And he said to him, God is with you, mighty man of valor or mighty warrior. Gideon He didn't know how to take that, and he talked back a little bit to the angel of the Lord, who's also called the Lord later on. And we mention that often when it talks about the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord is the Lord, or Christ himself appearing in human form before he came as a baby in Bethlehem. So we saw Gideon doing this and he received a commission from the Lord to lead God's people to throw off the oppression of the enemy. And Gideon asked the angel to wait while he went and prepared a meal. And that's where we're gonna pick up the story this morning. The angel of the Lord said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. That's Judges 6.20. Take the meat and take the bread and put it on this rock and then pour out that big pot of broth that you made. And uh, Gideon did that. 
Well, last time we talked about the generosity of Gideon's gift, how in times that were terrible, where there wasn't a whole lot of food, where things were scarce for everyone, he gave such a generous gift. And that, that's part of God's nature and something he's trying to develop in all of us. But in this, I see a little something different too, as Gideon willingly pours out that pot of broth. I don't know how often you cook things, cook down bones and meat and have a pot of broth at your house, but it's cherished at our house and we get great soups and things from a big pot of broth. And I wonder if some of us in Gideon's shoes would have argued, would have pushed back a little bit and said, wait a minute, okay, I'll put the meat and the bread here, but you want me to dump out the broth? Why would I waste that? Let me take it back to the house and they can make up something wonderful or just drink it as it is. It's very nourishing. There's a lot of food value there. And and push back against that. (laughs) I I see a life lesson here. We're going to look for life lessons again in Gideon's story. And the life lesson, as Gideon offers this meal to the Lord, uh, I see that I I skipped the slides. This is the first time we've used slides in over a year, so pardon me for my awkwardness with this. But uh, we talked about Gideon's generosity and God's generosity to us. And the life lesson is that we should give with no strings attached. Gideon offered the gift to God. And then when God says, okay, now just pour out the broth, he did it. He didn't ask any questions. He didn't push back. And that's how we should give our gifts, with no strings attached. Once we hand it over to the person we're giving it to, it's theirs to do with as they wish. I might make a wonderful carving and, and you know, expect you to put it on, your cent- on the center of your table and... and Let it be the centerpiece. And you look at it and say, hey, that would make a great doorstop. I'm just going to put it over here to hold the door open. Uh, Should I take offense? If I've given it as a gift, it should be with no strings attached. You can use it however you want. And, And I see a parallel there in another offering. In Romans chapter 12, Paul talks about us offering something to God. And as I think about Gideon giving with no strings attached, Uh, this passage came to mind. Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. God wants us to offer ourselves to him, all of us. He's not so concerned about little this and that. He wants us to offer our bodies, our whole being to him, every part of us, as an act of worship. Worship is more than just what we do Sunday morning for an hour or whenever you watch a video like this in these days. Worship is all that I do, all that I say, my attitudes, my approach, my motivations and intentions of my heart. Everything about my life is an act of worship. I'm either worshiping myself or my peers or other people, society and culture, or I'm actually trying to follow God and to please him, do what is holy and pleasing in his sight. And and I wonder today how many of us, probably most of us, have offered ourselves to God for his service. We say, God, I'm yours. I want to live for you. I want to please you. I want to follow you. But I also wonder if maybe there's some strings attached. And we say, yeah, God, here, I'm offering this to you, but, oh, you want me to pour out that broth? You want me to talk to this person? You want me to forgive that person? You want me to go where? You want me to do what? Well, oh, I'm all in, everything, except you know, this. Well, I can't do that. Uh, How often are there strings attached to our lives? Even when we say one minute, God, I'm all yours. I'm all in whatever you want. And then I I back off. I kind of rope off this little area of my life and say, except that, not that, Lord. Offer yourselves completely to God. Offer your bodies as an act of worship, living sacrifices to please him. And and so a corollary to the first life lesson would be give yourself to God with no strings attached. No strings attached. Completely surrender. I wonder how many of us have, have reached that level of commitment and surrender and obedience, really. That's what Gideon showed ultimately, right? Just obedience. What God said Gideon did. 
I think some of us are more like the boyfriend who uh, sent a poetic letter to his, the love of his life and said, you know, I would climb the highest mountain for you. I would swim the deepest seas. I would overcome any obstacle to be with you. And then he ended it with, oh, by the way, I'll see you tomorrow if it doesn't rain. And we're like, okay, God, this far, but not all the way. We need to get to the point where we say, God, I'll do anything for you. I'll talk to anyone for you. I'll forgive everyone for you. Whatever you want me to say, wherever you want me to go, I'm yours, all of me, no holding back, no strings attached. Well, back to Gideon. Gideon poured out the broth, and then the angel of the Lord had a stick, and he touched the meat and the bread and the tip, with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. What happened? What do you think happened when he did that? Fire flared up from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. Instantly, he was gone. What an amazing sight. What a, how incredible would that have been? Just mind-blowing, awesome. I, when's the last time you made a fire? When's the last time you tried to build a fire out of nothing? Have you used paper? Do you use kindling? Do you use wood chips? What do you use when you want to make a fire? I use those matches. Some people use, like lighter fluid all over. How do you build a fire? Imagine that you just had a rock. That's all you had, this, this rock. And you have to make fire come from that rock. We can't do that. It breaks the laws of nature. It's impossible for us to do that. Now, maybe if I had another rock, a flint, I could make it. I remember when I was a teenager, I worked at Old Fort Erie, and we had flint lock muskets. And the flint would hit, and the spark would hit the gunpowder, and you'd have combustion and an explosion, and the bullet would go out, the musket ball. That was pretty cool. I enjoyed doing that. And we'd fire cannons too, but this is different. There's nothing combustible here, just a rock with meat and bread on it. And when its staff touches it, a miracle happened. And Gideon was awestruck. The, the life lesson from that for me is that God is not limited by physical laws. The laws of the universe, the laws of physics, the laws that encompass all things in the natural realm, they don't apply to God. He's the one who made them. He's the one who created them. He's the one who stands above all the laws of nature. It's one of the reasons we have to believe in God is because of the laws of nature and his superiority to them. I remember going to a seminar at Waterloo University where Bill Phillips, who won the Nobel Prize in physics for slowing down a molecule the closest to absolute zero anyone ever had. And, and he's talking about faith and, and science and how they go together. They don't contradict one another. And he said there's this worldwide panel for faith and science and people from all different faiths, not just Christians. And, and there was a, I believe it was a Buddhist on the panel and they don't believe that God is a person. They just believe in the force almost. Not exactly. But he said, as he studied the universe, he's a cosmologist and, and how everything is so ordered he said, he's starting to think that there must be an intelligent mind, a person behind all of this. Well, that's what God has revealed in the Bible, that he is the designer. He is the creator of everything. And that's a reason that we should believe because all of the evidence points to a designer and you can't have designs without that. Why are there laws in the universe if there isn't someone who put them in place? And yet those laws don't apply to Jesus. He supersedes them. Remember the story of Elisha and the chariots of fire? In the Old Testament story of Elisha, we read that Elisha's servant came to him and said, Master, we're surrounded. The enemy armies have surrounded us. And Elisha said, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And he prayed that the servant's eyes would be open, and they were. God opened his eyes to see this spiritual reality, and he saw horses and chariots of fire surrounding them on the hills more than the enemy army that was there against them. God is spirit, and he's a spiritual being. He can appear and disappear at will. His angels can go from here to there in a 
blink of an eye in a heartbeat. They can cover massive distances. God is not limited by physical laws and properties because he is spirit. Remember what happened to Jesus after the resurrection? We read on the road to Emmaus, he started describing what was supposed to happen to the Messiah to two believers. And then he went in to the building with them to have a dinner, to have a meal. And it says, when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and gave thanks. He broke it and began to give it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They were blown away when Jesus just all of a sudden disappeared. And so they went to Jerusalem. They didn't wait till the next day. They went to Jerusalem. With, they told the people there, the other disciples, they said, hey, we saw Jesus and he was there. And they told him the whole story. And while they were still talking about it, we read, Jesus himself stood among them and he said to them, peace be with you. They were in a room, you remember, with the doors locked because they were afraid the Jews were going to come and drag them off and crucify them too. And yet Jesus just appeared out of nowhere, right in their midst. God is not limited by physical laws, by the laws of physics. He can overcome any obstacles in your life or mine too. He's the author of all these laws. The universe obeys the laws It's a reason to believe in God. That's why Jesus could calm a storm, speak to the wind and the waves, and he obeyed his voice, turn water into wine, walk on water, raise the dead. He he allowed Peter to walk on the water, a second hand, right? He could give his abilities to others as well. And, And the ultimate was when Jesus rose from the dead. He is not limited by physical laws. What is there in your life that you need a miracle from God, that you need something from God and you're afraid to ask it or maybe you've been asking and he hasn't answered yet and you've given up. God is not limited by physical laws. Whatever it is you need, ask him and see what he might do in response to it. Well, going back to Gideon, we read this. When Gideon realized it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Gideon's experience was more than amazing. It was fear-inducing. It was terrifying because he'd seen the Lord face to face. He was expecting that he would die. Now, why would Gideon think that? Why would his predisposition be that if you see God face to face, you're going to die? Gideon would have heard stories like Moses and the people of Israel at Mount Horeb when he received the Ten Commandments. And the mountain was shaking and it was smoking and the people were told, stay back from the mountain, rope it off, don't let the people come near the mountain. If they even touch the mountain, they'll die because God is powerful and God is holy and they weren't to approach him. And Moses himself, while they were still at Mount Horeb, asked God, show me your glory. And God says, you cannot look at my face and live. You can't look at my face and live. Gideon expected, having seen the Lord, that he would die. And and it says to me that we need to fear the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 3, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Most of us don't have a healthy fear of the Lord. Most of us don't have any fear of the Lord at all. We just are casual in our approach to him. We've been taught, and rightly so, that God isn't some angry judge up in heaven waiting to cast down lightning bolts and strike us dead if we transgress his commandments. God isn't, he's not like that. He's loving, he's merciful, he's forgiving, right? We've been told that our heavenly father loves us, that Jesus is our friend and brother, and he loves us. He loved us enough to die on the cross for us. And somehow we've taken that to become a very casual relationship where we no longer respect his holiness, his awesomeness, and and his power. And we just treat him like our buddy, and don't see who he is as something that should affect how we live. We don't need to be afraid of God if we're walking with him, if we're trying to live to please him, but we need to have an understanding that God is holy and he expects us to be holy and he wants what's best for us. If we don't live for him, he's going to bring correction into our lives in the form of discipline. 
Many of us have allowed all kinds of things from anger to apathy, gossip, lying, maybe cheating on our taxes or whatever it might be. And, and we've just allowed these things in our lives and we don't think it's a big deal when there's sin in our lives. The whole book of Judges, the story of Gideon is just part of the whole book of Judges, which is there as a warning for you and me that when we walk away from God, when we enter into sinful indulgences and practices instead of following his righteous ways, we set ourselves up for discipline. And the Lord brings discipline into our lives when we're going astray and living in a pattern that's gonna bring destruction to us personally. Listen to what Hebrews 12, five says. Do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. If you're loved by God, if you're trying to live for God, he's going to try and help guide you in the right ways. And one of the ways he does that is bringing discipline into our lives. The Lord disciplines the one he loves. The, Next part says, we've all had human fathers and they disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. We respected them because they disciplined us. They didn't just let us go crazy and do damage. They would correct us. They would rebuke us. They would turn us back to what is right. I hope you grew up in a home where you were loved by your parents. I knew my mom and dad loved me. But you know what? They showed that love in ways I didn't always appreciate. Sometimes they would give me a curfew that I didn't want, tell me I couldn't go to some place that I wanted to go. Or they would give me a bedtime that I needed to follow and I thought I should be able to stay up later. Oh, the worst is like between now and the end of June when it's light out until 10 o'clock at night and you have to go to bed at 8.30 or 9 o'clock. It's like, but it's still light out. I could be out there playing and... As a kid, that caused me a lot of trauma. Do you have some of that trauma too? Our parents do what they believe is best for us, as the best they understand it. It says that God, similarly, he wants what's best for us too. So he disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. God's plan for you and me is to share in his holiness. So he disciplines us not for his benefit, for our benefit. Just like a good parent does, when they see us acting selfishly, when they see us being hurtful to others, when they see us starting down a path that's gonna to lead to more pain later on, they discipline us to correct us, to turn us away from that. If you had a child who was reaching for a hot stove or a hot pan or some other hot item and they were gonna burn themselves and you didn't do something to stop them, you'd be considered negligent as a parent. Now, for some of you, maybe you could say, oh, please don't touch that, and the child wouldn't touch it. But most children that I know, and I'd be included in that when I was a kid, need something more than just, oh, please don't touch that. Because once they've started reaching for it, they're going to keep going, and they're going to touch that thing. And, and the parent sometimes has to inflict a little bit of pain in order to keep that child from greater pain or even disaster and the consequences of what they're doing. If they grab that and hold on to that hot thing, they're gonna burn their hands severely. And so maybe you have to grab the hand or slap the hand or grab the child and pull them back. And it may be not just uncomfortable, but painful. God says that discipline is painful. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it's painful. And as parents, sometimes we forget that and we wanna just be friends and buddies with our kids, but sometimes we need to discipline them and Effective discipline it has some measure of pain involved. Now, it might just be that you don't let them get together with their friends. There's a lot of that going on right now. So that's maybe not something even that makes a difference. Also, if you banish your child to their room, but they always spend time in their room on their devices anyway, that's not really a painful discipline. They're not gonna learn anything. It's not gonna reinforce your point. Discipline needs to have some measure of pain to be effective or at least severe discomfort for the person being disciplined. Discipline, God disciplines us for our own good because later on, we read, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. That's God's goal, that we'll become people who know what's right and do what's right, who live in righteous ways, holy like he is holy. And then that brings peace in our soul 
When we're living the way God wants us to, we experience much greater levels of inner peace instead of the turmoil that comes when we indulge in sinful practices. But it takes training. Over time, God does this, and we get trained up in righteousness and grow in peace. <coughs> so should we fear God or, or not? Uh, what really, most people in our day, a lot of Christians think, well, we shouldn't fear God at all. And we don't have to be afraid of him. Perfect love does cast out fear, but John, when he says that, is talking about fear of judgment, final judgment, and really. But there's a healthy fear of the Lord that keeps us from sin, from wandering away and going astray and embracing destructive patterns for our life. Think about Job. Job is somebody who is considered the most righteous man on the face of the earth. And this is what the Lord said about him. The Lord said, there is no one on earth like him, like Job. He is a man who is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. That's the kind of fear of the Lord you and I need to have. The kind that trains us to shun evil because we don't want to disappoint God, we don't want to hurt God, and we don't want to be the objects of discipline that he has to bring correction and rebuke into our lives and, and painful consequences to stop us from even greater disaster down the road. Well, verse 22, Gideon says, Gideon realizes that it's the angel of the Lord and he exclaims, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And then it continues, But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. So life lesson four, God speaks. He's a communicator. It's one thing for the angel of the Lord when he's standing right there to talk to Gideon. But remember that when he touched the offering and the fire leaped out of the rock, the angel of the Lord disappeared. He was gone. And yet still, after Gideon says, oh no, I'm going to die, the angel says, peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. The angel of the Lord, or the Lord, speaks to Gideon even though he's not physically present. Later on in the narrative, we see that happens again as multiple times the Lord speaks to Gideon. He gives him instructions for how to carry out this mission that he's been called to. God is a communicator. And as we look through the Bible, he communicates in many different ways. People sometimes hear an audible voice, but most of the time it's an inner voice, an impression of the Holy Spirit. Remember Elijah on the mountain? It was the still small voice. God communicates through dreams and visions and pictures and ideas and thoughts that are implanted in our mind many different ways he communicates with us. God still communicates in our day and uh, we're going to have a seminar coming up called Hearing God. Very simple name, but we're hoping that you'll be willing to join in either in person on Monday nights or online on Tuesdays as we learn to discern more fully how God speaks to us in our day and how we can grow our relationship with him and our communication with him. I hope you'll take seriously the invitation to join us for that. God is still communicating in our day. In verse 23, the Lord said to him, peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, the Lord is peace. The Lord is peace. Now, most of us, when we think about who God is and how God is, the first thing that comes to mind is that God is love, right? From 1 John, God is love. We all know that. We know that's part of his character and something he wants to develop in our lives, that we become more like him in loving others. But we talked last week about other parts of his character, or two weeks ago, about God's generosity, about God's patience, and how he wants to develop those characteristics in us. And here, he reveals himself as a God of peace. He speaks peace to Gideon, and Gideon names the new altar, the Lord is peace. When we saw Jesus appearing after the resurrection, he said to the disciples when he appeared to them, peace be unto you. The Lord is peace. He gives peace to us, and he wants us to live in that peace. Let's jump ahead a slide or two here. The Lord is peace, and we have peace with God 
through our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul wrote. Jesus is the one who's paved the way for us to have peace by the forgiveness of our sins, by inclusion in God's family. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then when Jesus was in the upper room with the disciples, he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. God gives peace. Jesus gives peace. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. When we're all churning on the inside, it's because we're letting our hearts be troubled. We're allowing that to happen. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. We think, well, no, I just, I just am because of circumstance and everything. everybody would be troubled by this. Yes, Yes, that's the initial reaction often to what's going on. But it shows us that we have work to do in terms of trusting God with whatever the situation is. And until we come to the place in this situation, whatever it is, of fully trusting God with it, we're going to be churning on the inside. We're going to be all worked up. We're going to be anxious and fretting and worried and troubled. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. And Isaiah kind of gives us an insight into how that works. He says, you, Lord, God, you will keep them in perfect peace whose trust is in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. When we're fixed on our troubles and our problems, we become more anxious and troubled. When we're fixed on Jesus and we're thinking about him and his abilities to handle anything that comes our way, then the peace of God that passes understanding can keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, like Paul wrote in Philippians 4. The Lord is peace, and he wants his peace to flow through us, to hold us up through difficult times, to keep us from being full of fear and worry and trouble. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the lessons we can learn from your word. Thank you that you are priest peace, that you bring peace to our soul. Lord, many of us today need to refocus on you, need to fully trust you with what's going on in our lives and in the world around us so that we can tie into your peace once again. Lord, forgive us for trusting ourselves and the people around us instead of placing our trust fully in you. Let your peace reign in our hearts today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that's most of what we have for today. There will be a closing song, It Is Well With My Soul. I hope you'll watch that as well. May the Lord bless you and keep you and fill you with his peace this week. Amen.
confidence and assurance that he walks with you and leads you through life. And may he show you how you can touch someone else for his good and their good and his glory. Amen. Just a reminder.